Good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Let's give God a hand clap of praise that you were able to make it into his house today. Let's also give some love to the people on the other side of the camera. They watch from all over the world, believe it or not. Give them some love. We appreciate them tuning in. So, uh, I am so thankful you are here today. I am so thankful for those of you who are watching online and here. I'm just going to say this right out of the gate. Today is not a normal day for you to be here. And here's why. I'm going to get as real today as I ever can. With God's help. And some of you may be thinking what I'm talking about, I'm good. I'm good in this area when it comes to talking about the soul. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. If your soul's good, you thank God for that. That's a praise. But there may be somebody else that needs to do a soul checkup. Are you with me today, church? Are you with me today, church? So you're going to be praying today, are you? You're going to be praying. All right, all right. So we've been in this series called um, Body, Mind, and Soul. We talked about the body a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we talked about the mind last week. And uh, if you were not able to be able to be here, be here for that, uh, I think it was some things that I learned myself. I hope you learned from that, something you might want to share. But today, we're going to move in and we're going to talk about the soul. Now, when you think about the series, I want to ask you to do me a favor because I want you to remember this particular verse. Would you stand with me just for a moment, just to stretch one more time, and then you can be seated for a little bit of time. Let's read this together out loud in what it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says, may the God of peace make you holy through and through. May you be kept in soul and mind and body in spotless integrity until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to read it in your house today. This is the house of prayer, and we lift our voices of praise and adoration to you. I pray, God, right now that you move in with the power of your Holy Spirit in a convicting, loving way. And may every heart know undoubtedly by the time our time is done here together that they know where their soul is going. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody says, amen. amen. You can be seated. So, we see that what Paul is saying here is that when it comes to you and I, our whole being is made up of physical, mental, and spiritual. So, we know that today, after talking about the body and the mind, we're going to talk about the soul. Now, I don't know about you, but as I set it up like this, I remember growing up as a kid, I loved Soul Train. How many of you here love Soul Train when you're growing up? It's okay to raise your hand in church that you like Soul Train. Because when it would come on like this, I was ready to do a little tapping. Check this out, right? And when I hear it on TV, it'd be coming on like this right here. Here, here we go. Here we go. I'll stop while I'm ahead. I love watching Soul Train. How many of you have no idea what Soul Train is? Raise your hand. Okay. That's probably the young folks in the crowd, right? Man, I loved it because I was a kid watching it. And here's what's cool about it. I don't know if you know this, but Soul Train aired from 1971 to 2006, 35 years. And what it was, there was a whole lot of different artists on there. It was all kinds of different people on there. There was R&B, there was rap, there was hip hop, there was jazz, there was disco, even gospel artists on there. But here's one thing about Soul Train. Soul Train had absolutely nothing to do with the eternity of the soul. You follow what I'm saying? When you think about your soul and you think about who you are, what the soul is, is different than the body. The human soul is central of the personhood of a human being. I love what the 19th century Christian minister and author George MacDonald said. Listen to this, and I quote him. He says, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. In other words, the personhood of who you are is not based on you having a body. The soul is what's required. So this is what was interesting to me when I was studying about the soul. Have you ever heard before, church, that the soul has weight? 
to it. Anybody ever heard that before? The soul has weight to it. Now grab this. In 1988, there was a study that was done from a science experiment, a noetic study of the human soul. They took 200 different terminally ill patients and they weighed them before they died and they weighed them immediately after they died. Grab this, every single one of those people weighed exactly one three thousandths of an ounce less. All the way across the study. As a matter of fact, and I want to quote somebody as well here, it is the Dr. Beckner Mertens of Dresden, he said this, it's, it's this astonishing claim, it's an inescapable conclusion that we have now confirmed the existence of the human soul and determined its weight. It says, he went on to say that the challenge before us is now to figure out exactly what the soul is composed of. We are inclined to believe that it is a form of energy. But our attempts to identify this energy have been unsuccessful to date. Let me ask you all this. Do you believe that you have a soul? Would you raise your hand? Would you do that? And it's okay if you don't believe it, okay? But I want you to think with me from this term. You're not just a human, you are a soul. And people can be guilty of doing everything they can to pamper the body that's going to, listen, have a limited earthly life and neglect the soul which is going to be continuing long after earthly life is done. Now in the Bible, repeatedly in the Bible, it says that the Bible here, people referred to our souls. Jesus said this himself. Check this out and stay with me. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26 says, And whatever you do, and what you do, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? He says, is anything more important than your soul? So Jesus, what he's doing here, and and he's saying, he has a two-part question here that he's asking, but it's also a two-part question that all of us need to ask of ourselves. Jesus is saying, it's a very foolish bargain that we should try to exchange our souls for the world for which we live. See, humanity's problem is that if you don't know Jesus in your heart, then you make a choice as though there isn't an afterlife. Let me say that again and understand what I'm saying. Humanity's problem is, is if you do not make, if you do not make a choice to make Jesus your Lord in life, Lord in your life and Lord in your soul, then you're making a choice as if there isn't an afterlife. The life that we're living now is the introduction to eternity. Therefore, we've got to recognize the value of our souls. It's very valuable. You say, well, just how valuable is it? Well, first and foremost, your soul is valuable because it's made in God's image. Genesis is very clear. The first book in the Bible, it says that God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Look at the person next to you and say, that's you. Look, now look back up and say, that's you too, okay? Male and female, he created them. However... Understand that God does not have a physical body like you and I have a physical body. When you look in John's gospel, chapter 4 and verse 24, look what it says. It says, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in what? Therefore, we see this, we must be a soul that is in God's image, but understand it's not in the physical sense for what you and I are living and breathing right now. We are in God's image that because we possess his wisdom, his intellect, his emotion, and his will, because that's what is like God. That is different than you would say from an animal, so to speak. So I'll tell you another way that's very important that you understand your value is that your soul is made to live eternally. Now, when you think about eternity, your soul is never going to die. Your soul is going to live forever and ever. I love how the message translates this this mindset in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It says, life lovingly while it lasts is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. 
The body is put back into the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. How many of you agree with me here today that life is fragile? Would you raise your hand? I was just talking to Paul, our worship leader up here, worship leading, was talking about just in the last month, he was just telling me before service that he lost two uncles. You know what? He didn't never shed a tear. You know why? Because he knows by their life, he said, they've gone to be with the Lord. See, there's no tears to cry. He knows where they are eternally, see? And so death is evident, but our soul will return to God who gave you your soul. So knowing we have no control over our next heartbeat, shouldn't that motivate everyone to seek God? And you say, well, why? Why would that motivate us to seek him? Because Paul was very clear in his second letter to the Corinthian church, which is applicable to us. He said, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or, what's that word? What's that word? Evil. We have done in this earthly body. See, we're all going to give an account for how we have lived here on earth. So I'll also tell you something else, the reason that your soul is so valuable. And I'm going to park here just a little bit longer. You've got to consider Satan's interest in you and your soul. Think with me for a moment. Think about how the enemy is. The devil is wide open, working very hard in this world to run after souls like you and me. How many of you here will agree with me by the shape that the world's in and the evil that's going on in the world? Would you agree with me? There is an adversary that's called Satan. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes, we all agree with that, right? So when you think about him and what he's doing, 1 Peter 5 and 8, listen to what Peter said. He said, stay alert. Because we all just said that he's real. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Well, here, when I was studying this week and I was thinking, I think a lot of people today, they don't realize what has upset the enemy, the devil, so bad that he would be so interested in my soul and yours. Have you ever thought in that measure? Well, I can tell you when it comes to him, he was Lucifer that was once in heaven and he became so consumed with pride over his God-given splendor that he was no longer willing to serve under God. So this sense of superiority that led Lucifer to take his free will to scheme against God and to be able to assemble an army of angels to help him carry out this plot that he wanted to overthrow God. So Satan's sin, listen closely, was a swan of pride and rebelling against God and attempting to take from God the praise and the glory that only belong to the Lord God Almighty. That's why when you look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, start and look at the sins that God hates. It begins off topping the list with pride. God hates it. God hates it. See, pride, in the Bible, when you look at that, it's not condemning the pride of feelings that you may have. Maybe you're in school right now and you made the dean's list. Or maybe it's a situation where that you worked very hard. You're the person that come in early. You stayed late. You locked the building up. And next thing you know, you got an amazing promotion and you got a raise in the process. Or maybe you had some health conditions and you made some changes in your diet and now you've lost 10 pounds and you're feeling better. There's nothing wrong with that kind of pride. That's not the pride that God is talking about. The pride the Bible is referring to is when you are obsessed with yourself that you never want to turn to God and you never want to allow your heart to really seek Him in your life. See, you and I are blessed that Satan's prideful scheme to overthrow God failed. We're blessed. So God's punishment for Satan 
and his angels for the disobedience and the, the dishonor was to cast him, them out of heaven and down to earth. And ultimately, they're going to spend eternity in the devil's hell. Not my hell, not your hell, but the devil's hell. Because it was made for him and his angels. So, once Lucifer was thrown out, he realized that he didn't have any power to directly take God's throne from him. So instead, he tried to do what he could do to be able to overpower God in another way. In other words, to get back at God another way. By what he was doing here, he was wanting to come at you and I and tempt us that we would not seek God and that you and I would abandon God. And if you've ever saw a time in our nation, God is being abandoned in this nation. And it's never a time for us to abandon a great God who loved us the way that he does. But why is that taking place? Because the enemy, Lucifer, whose name is now turned to be able to be Satan, he has become humanity's adversary. He has become humanity's accuser. And he's known as Satan for his deceitful temptations. And he wants to rob humanity of your eternal soul. He wants to rob you from salvation that Jesus Christ come to give in each and every one of us. Because he is the one who has fallen from grace of Almighty God. Look at his purpose. John 10, 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I'll tell you another reason that your soul is so valuable, I want you to realize the sacrifice, the concern and sacrifice that God has to be able to save our souls. God is so compassionately in love with you and with me. And when you look at what he has done, it says here that he's waiting about, he's waiting on people to get it right. Second Peter 3 and 9, the Lord really isn't being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. See, the enemy's wanting to destroy, but he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. See, these believers for which at the time of the hearing and the time of the writing that Peter was writing to, they couldn't understand why God seemed to be slow in his return because they were facing real persecution every day that were costing Christians their lives. But when you think about even our day today, how many of you are like me? How much more do you think God could ever allow this world to become more wicked? I just, it just seems like every day, it seems like it just God, you just couldn't allow it to get any more wicked before you return. Listen to me, please. God's not slow. God's not on our timetable. I hope you understand that. The heart of God is that more sinners, that is people that miss the mark, all of us miss the mark. That's what it means. We don't have it all together. We don't have all the righteous T's crossed and all the holy I's dotted in our lives. But what he is wanting is that we would come to repentance and turn to Jesus. Romans 5, 8 and 9 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. See, God sees our souls as the most valuable thing in the entirety of the world. Why? Because God allowed his only son to die for our souls. You know what that means? Let me tell you what that means. That means you are more sinful than you ever dared to believe. Romans, you look at 3 and 23, for we have all sinned and fall short of God's glory standard. But understand, you are more loved than you ever dared to hope. You're loved. Look at the person next to you and say, you're loved. We're all love. Thank God for his love because God is what? He's love. But I'll tell you one more thing of why your soul is so valuable. Because your soul 
has an eternal destination. I said, what do you mean? They were so tired of the oppression of the Roman rule. And Jesus was trying to get them out of their carnal mind and state of what they were thinking about of the oppression and wanting Jesus to take over Rome. And he's trying to let them know because their hearts are so troubled. In John 14, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. He said, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you. Praise God. When everything is ready, I will come and get you. Those that are his own. Those who have made preparations. Listen, um, y'all patty caking out there. So I used to do that when I was a kid and patty cake and all that kind of stuff. If we're going to praise God, let's, let's lift the roof off the place and praise him in his house. Let's give him some praise for salvation. Yes, yes, yes. So Jesus went on to tell them in chapter 14 of John's gospel. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way because he was both God and man. And when we unite our lives with Jesus, we unite our lives with God. And when Jesus says that he is the way, that is the only means and the only path to the Father. And you might argue, well, it, you know, it's narrow. They say it's narrow, but there's got to be many ways. If there was many ways to get to God, do you think that he would allow his son to die if, he could get, if we could get to him some other way? If you were God the Father and you had one son, and they could get through there through Islam, they could get through there through Scientology, they could get there through Mormonism, do you think that God the Father would have allowed his only son to come down the stairway of heaven, put on skin, be tempted in the same way we're tempted, and die the most brutal death that ever is? Do you believe that? If you believe that he wouldn't have done that if there was another way, would you agree with me and say, no, he wouldn't have allowed his son to die? Say, no. He wouldn't have. There's no way. Jesus said, there is a heaven and there is a hell. He spoke of it. And the question is, have you investigated that for yourself? It's easy for us to down maybe what other people believe. But the question is, is what do you believe? When you think about the subject of hell, it's not pleasant. Nobody wants to talk about it. Jesus talked about it because mankind's souls have an eternal destination and you matter when it comes to where you're going to spend eternity. And my heart is for everyone here in this auditorium and everyone that may be on the other side of the camera that you run from a place called hell and you run to Jesus Christ. And when you understand in your life what Jesus did for you to be able to escape hell, you'll understand God's love for you more and more and more. But hell, once again, is not a popular thing to talk about. Did you know that 13% of Christ's words were about eternity. Did you know that two-thirds of Christ's parables were heaven and hell issues? Eternity, eternity the word means world without end. The fact is, not everyone is going to heaven. You say, well, that sounds very encouraging, Pastor. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, well, I'll agree with that. You know, the mass murderer, I don't think he'll go to heaven. Or I'm thinking, well, that child molester, he's not going to go to heaven. Or, or that rapist is not going to go to heaven. Yeah, it, but this is what Matthew 7, 13, 14 says. It says, first 13 says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many. Say many. What do they do? What's the many do? Choose that way. A lot of people say, well, you pastor, you know, man, I'm a good person. You know, good people are going to go to heaven. Only the good die young. I mean, you know, and I'm, I help with charities and I do this and I do that. I just, I'm just the messenger. I didn't write the book, okay? Verse 14 says, but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. Doesn't mean it's easy. Doesn't mean it's the life of Riley. And only a few ever find it. A few ever find it. Christ's words. 
See, a majority of us will find reason if we're not careful not to believe and not to trust. And that means more people will go to hell than they go to heaven. Why is that? Because we live today like our lives are indestructible. (laughs) I have my own mind. I think my own thoughts. I know what's best for me. Well, here's something that I I want to, I think I'm going to put it up on the screen. Self-reliance leads to self-deception, which ultimately leads to self-destruction. You say, oh, come on, pastor. You're not very encouraging today. How could only a few people ever find it? You want me to tell you the truth or you want me to give you a political answer? People say, well, oh, there's all kinds of roads to heaven. Once again, Jesus would never have had to have died. The terrible death on the cross, if that was true. There are many people today that think they are Christians that are not. You say, well, now he stepped into the realm of judging people. The fruit bears its witness. I've done so many funerals and it makes me sick doing a funeral because it was never supposed to be that way. Sin started in the garden with Adam and Eve and that's why sin has been brought on to mankind. And people just look at me and they say, oh, they're in a better place. You think so? You really think so? The person laying there in the casket's in a better place. They never had any fruit of evidence of of being a Christian. They never had any evidence. They never had any, any proof of that. Everything was absent of that. And they never had a profession of faith. And they never showed that they loved God. They never had anything to do with his church. And you're telling me they're in a better place. Matthew 7, 21, beginning there. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, cast demons out in your name, and perform many miracles in your name. I went to church. I went on mission trips. I gave money. I rang the bell for the Salvation Army every year at Christmas at Walmart. I was a Baptist. I was a Church of Christ. I was a Catholic. I was a Lutheran. I was a Methodist was this. I was that. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. And it always I have these questions from people. Pastor, how could a loving God, you said God is love. How could a loving God put a human being with a soul in hell? He won't. You'll volunteer without reservations. You have to have reservations for heaven. Here's what I want you to understand. Hell is a place of no Second chances. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So I have a question for you. Because I love you from the depths of my soul. I spent more time on this this week than any message I've spent on in the last three or four years. Let me ask you, friend, what will you exchange your soul for? Mark 8, verse 36 and 37 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? See, when you look at the word exchange, it pictures a business transaction in which one is bartering for something else. Barter meaning to trade or to exchange something from one commodity for another. Thus, it means to, to trade your soul for something else. What will you exchange your soul for? Earthly riches, earthly fame. Will you exchange your soul for power, lustful pleasures, sexual immorality, drunkenness, envy? 
We exchange your soul for a false doctrine of lies that you're believing that there's not just not a hell, but I don't believe there's a heaven either. I believe nothing happens when you die. It's like atheist Joe when he died, all dressed up, no place to go. Or will you exchange your, your soul for the lie that Satan's telling you right now? A lot of people, I believe he's telling you in this audience right now, that you have plenty of time. And I truly believe that is one of his number one tools he uses against humanity is that you have, my friend, plenty of time. Here's what I know, and I think you do too. If you succeed in the things of this world, come what may, and you lose your soul to hell, then you've not only been a miserable failure of opportunity, but it truly would have been better that you were never born. So let's take a moment to look at God's soul plan. First and foremost, whoever you are, listen, don't let the devil tell you lies. And I've always thought of it. Listen, I want you to weigh up his soul plan for you today. First thing, you got to turn. No matter how far that you walk and you go away from God, all of a sudden when you come to yourself and you turn, there's God just right in front of you, been following you the whole time. Turn to him. Romans 2 and 4 says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Sin meaning you're missing the mark with anything. Anything that him that knows to do good and to do right and doesn't do it to him, it's sin. To her, it's sin. Something else you gotta, you gotta trust. Once you turn, you've got to trust. See, there's a lot of people, no doubt, in here that you have trusted somebody and you got burned by trusting them. We understand an acquaintance is just somebody that, that we've known slightly or maybe a touch of intimacy. We've had friends that, that we hang out with, but a true friend is the one who's walking in when everybody else is walking out, and that's Almighty God. I like what Hebrews 11 and 6 says, it says it's, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Let me ask you a question. How many of you here would lift your hand and say, you know, apart from anything else that was going on in my life, in my life before I came to this moment right now, how many of you would say, I really do want to please God? I really do want to please God. Thank you. God bless you. I do too. And you got to trust Him and take that faith step. But when you take that, you've turned and you trust Him, you got to confess to Him. Confess meaning that I agree, I don't have it all together. First John 1 and 9 saying, but if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness, anything that's wrong. He wants to give you that spiritual cleansing and take out that which is not of God and cast it as far as the east is the west and give you that spiritual cleansing. And Romans 10 and 9 tells us that if you openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's meaning that salvation in Christ is as close as your own lips and your heart is today. Don't overcomplicate it and don't make it hard. But after that takes place, you simply follow him. To be a Christian is to be a follower. John 8 and 12, Jesus spoke to these people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You're not going to be in darkness of a purposeless life. You're not going to be in darkness stumbling alone. You're not going to be in darkness just existing without God. You know what's amazing? 
the day that Jesus died, all his friends saw his death as the end, but it was really the beginning that gave hope to all of humanity. And I want you to understand the amazing thing about when he died. People were hurting and people were hopeless and people were fearful, just like they are today. Maybe that's you today. You're hurting in your relationships. Or you're hurting in your finances. Or you're fearful about the future. Maybe because you've been allowing your past to keep you from where God wants to take you. You see, God's not interested in your past, but he is highly interested in this moment and this day forward. Jesus wasn't surprised the day that he died because he was fulfilling his Father's will. That he would come here to be able to give all of humanity hope and peace and joy and boundless love if you would turn to him, trust him, confess to him. And follow him. He wants to help you in your life. Bring healing to your brokenness. And he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll go with you. Even to the end of the world that we reside in. So I asked you another question. How's your soul? How's your soul? And I want to ask you to do this. Don't let the pride and the temptation of the enemy right now tell him, say, get away from me. I'm doing business with God. Just tell him, say, get away from me. I'm doing business with God, my creator. Rebuke him in the name of Jesus. He has to flee. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I give you rest Jesus says take my yoke upon you let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light I don't know about you but I've been close to death several times. And one time in particular, it was August of 1998, we were building a home. And out back of the home, there was what we called a trash pit. You throw things in there and you burn it and get rid of the scrap lumber and all those kind of things. My wife was out there and my middle daughter, India, was out there. She was just like four years old. And uh, this dummy with it full of lumber and it dry (laughs) decided gasoline would be the trick to go ahead and upstart the fire. So I walk over to this hole that's about six feet wide. It's about eight or nine feet long and it's about six or seven feet deep. And I pour gasoline on. And then I walk away with it. You know, you need to get the gas jug away from the fire, right? So I carry it way, 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 way. Back over here, and I had on tennis shoes, knee shorts, a nail apron, and a T-shirt, a hat, and sunglasses. And I had found a lighter that someone had somehow left one of the subs in the house, and I found it, and I had it in my pocket. So I go over here to the corner of the hole. After about a minute, and I light it. That's all I remember. All I could remember was screaming from my wife, screaming from my daughter, and I could see nothing but pitch black. And I felt as if I was gone and I was looking for the light. Looking for the light to come. And then finally, my wife is shaking me, and I'm getting up, and the hide's blood off my arm, off my legs, face, different things. And 
But in that moment, I was looking for the light. Yes, I knew Christ. I knew I had reservations, but it was a scary moment for me. And so in that moment, I don't know about your moments in life, but when you're a Christian and you receive Christ, to close your eyes in death is to open your eyes with the Lord. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So thank God that I got through that and I had salvation. But it was a moment that I thought, where's the light? I don't want you to ever question where the light is. Because if you make reservations now, you won't have to question. In a moment, we're going to sing a song and I'm going to have you stand to your feet and I want you to do business with God right up here. Don't worry about who you're sitting with, if you're sitting with your wife or your husband or with your kids or family or friends. Matter of fact, if you're sitting with somebody, tell them, I'll go with you. But I want you to make sure that you're going to see the light. Because here's the thing about it. We're all going to check out. But where we check in is your decision when it comes to your soul. So, with that being said, a lot of times the enemy is going to do whatever he can do to stop you in your tracks because he hates you and he hates me. Why? Because he can't have what you can have. He's done. His eternity is sealed in a devil's hell because it's his, not yours nor mine. So here's what I want to say to you and what Jesus said in Matthew 10. He said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But anyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Stand and bow your heads with me, please. Bow your heads with me if you're watching online. As you bow your heads, you know really today why God brought you here, and it was for this moment. He knows if you're hurting. He knows if you're on the verge of giving up. He knows if you're scared. He knows if you're stressed out. He knows if you're looking for relief right where you're at. And sometimes we feel like as human beings that it's against all odds. And, but understand, God chooses to do in a moment what we could never do in a lifetime. So after I pray in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward. And I don't want you to wait. I want you to run up here like you're running from hellfire. Just like that day that I almost killed myself with fire make your way up here nobody's going to do anything weird we're not going to do anything that's going to be freaky or not like it. just come up here and stand and we want to pray with you to ensure that you know the value of your soul and you know the destination of your soul heavenly father we praise you and we thank you god lord for this moment we know god it's going to take courage god for those to ensure that they know where they're going i pray god that christians are praying right now god and i pray god that if someone is standing with someone that they'll even ask them already do you want to go up and they'll come with them and pray because it can be something you might worry and what people are going to think we're not going to think anything but we know that heaven's going to have a party because their souls matter and their soul's destination matters most so right now lord jesus do a mighty work through the power, conviction, and love of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Freedom Church Online. We're so excited that no matter what your situation is in life, you've made receiving God's word today a priority. If you've given your life to Jesus today, that's awesome. And we want to know about it. As a church family, we want to be there for you as you begin this exciting journey. If you're on the Freedom Church app or on our website, just hit the hamburger icon in the top left of your screen and hit connection card. Now, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, hit the link in the description. Just fill out the information on the form and let us know about this exciting decision that you have made. If you did receive Christ today for the first time, your next step would be baptism. If you notice on the form, there's a place to select that as well. You can also select any other next steps you may be interested in. Once you submit it, we'll be in contact with you to help you out and answer any questions that you may have. We also want to take this time to give back to God a portion of what he has so graciously given to us. If you're on our app or website, just hit the same hamburger icon from before and hit giving. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, just hit the link in the description. 
These all take you to a secure place to submit your offering. Also, just because we live in the age of technology doesn't mean you can't send in your tie the old fashioned way. If you seal it up in an envelope and send it to the address on your screen, that'll work just as well. We want everyone to be able to experience the blessings that come from being faithful and trusting God with what he has blessed us with. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you all back with us next week.